Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well this morning. Enjoying the sunshine today. Amen. I told you this past week it's 30, it's 40, then it's 70, and snow showers Wednesday. Woo! North Carolina weather. Amen. Make sure you know what you're wearing. You don't ever put up your shorts. You don't ever put up your long sleeves. You just kind of keep them all out, right? So glad you're here this morning, and uh, if you are uh, with us as a first-time guest, we're so glad that you're here. Maybe you're here just kind of checking out our church and checking out this whole Easter thing, and we are currently in the middle of this series called Jesus, Dead or Alive. You know, we're presenting what the Bible says about this and what historians have seen to be true, and then you get to decide, is he dead or alive? And so this morning, we're going to uh, pick back up with that and jump right in. And uh, this morning, I hope that you are excited to be here because I believe God's got a word for us all. I believe he has just shown us through his word that he endured many things, but many things that we endure and we wonder where he is. Well, he's already been there and done that. You know how we say that sometimes, been there, done that. Every emotion, everything we experience, he has experienced already. So sometimes when we get in this uh, notion to have a, a pity party for ourselves and we only invite ourselves because we don't want anybody else around when we're having it, Jesus already knows how we feel. He's already been through that and God through having sent his son to endure those same things that we experience knows that pain as well. But I hope you are uh, glad to be here and that you're not angry. Some of you are angry this morning because your team didn't win already. <laughs> Some of you are already looking forward to this game today, whatever it might be, or Next weekend, maybe your team's already in for next weekend. This is always a fun time of year with March Madness and basketball. But don't let it spill over into your lives that you live every day. See, some of you don't even care about, uh, there is a basketball game. I didn't even know there were basketball games. But I was in Hickory the other day, had on my UNC hat at a grocery store. And I was just walking up the aisle in the evening, just walking up the aisle by myself, no family with me, just by myself, kind of enjoying the time, looking, oh, I don't get to go in this store much, okay, well, hmm. And a guy from another aisle walks over to me, and he just looked at me, and he went, I hope they lose by 50 points. <laughs> I, was, I said, all righty then, well, I hope you have a blessed day, too. He said, and just so you know, yes, I am a Duke fan. So... But I did miss my evangelical opportunity because I should have said, after later giving it some more thought, well, I'm a pastor and I don't support the devil in any fashion, no matter what color. <laughs> so, just throwing that out there. So, I know a lot of y'all are really pulling against my team today now. So, but anyway, on with what we've got for today. Well, on with what we've got for today. In talking about uh, this series and in getting ready for it and sharing last week about how the events that will unfold were already predicted. Death was predicted. Death was foretold. But today we're going to talk about suffering inflicted. Suffering inflicted. And many of us have had to suffer through some things and it's not easy. But this particular suffering we're going to talk about today is very much something we would hope we wouldn't have to ever endure. And so we're going to begin in Mark. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, if you have your iPad or your phone, go ahead and get there. We're going to be looking at verse 43, beginning in verse 43. So you go ahead and be turning there. And we're going to be talking about uh, today some things that happen along the way that many of you may have already felt, not to this degree, but so much so that they have affected you in your life. 
Beginning in verse 43 of chapter 14, the book of Mark. It says, And immediately, even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. Then you can take him away under guard. As soon as they arrived, Judas walked up to Jesus. Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him the kiss. Not a kiss, but the kiss, the signal. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Jesus asked them, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with me at me with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there among you teaching every day. He said, But these things are happening to fulfill what the scriptures say about me. So he's saying, Hey, This is all happening. Not surprised. It's been foretold. Verse 50. Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. One young man following behind was clothed only in a long linen shirt. When the mob tried to grab him, he slipped out of his shirt and ran away naked. They took Jesus to the high priest's home where the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and went right into the high priest's courtyard. There he sat with the guards, warming himself by the fire. Inside, the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they couldn't find any. Many false witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. Finally, some men stood up and gave this false testimony. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. But even they didn't get their story straight. Then the high priest stood up before the others and asked Jesus, Well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus was silent and made no reply. Then the high priest asked him, Are you the one, the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, Why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. Then some of them began to spit at him, and they blindfolded him and beat him with their fists. Prophesy to us, they jeered. And the guards slapped him as they took him away. The first thing we see in this passage is that Jesus was betrayed. It was foretold, he knew it was coming, but he was betrayed. Betrayal is something that strikes a chord in all of us. In this particular case, it's one of those who was closest to him, betrayed him for a few pieces of silver so that he might be arrested. Given up, sold out, throwing away the relationship, giving up on all of it so that he might better himself. If I ask you this morning, is there a time in your life that you have ever felt betrayed? That someone close to you who thought you thought they had your back, all of a sudden, they didn't. 
Is there ever been a time, has there ever been a time in your life where you felt completely betrayed? It's a sinking feeling, isn't it? This is the traitor in verse 44. Judas had given a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So it was even planned. Sometimes you may feel betrayed and maybe there was a lack of information or maybe there was something that wasn't shared or there was an issue, but this was planned. This was planned. Can you imagine what Jesus felt? Because as soon as the signal was given, they grabbed him. They wrapped their arms around him. They jerked him. They arrested him on the spot. And in doing so, that betrayal was finished. And the arrest completed the plan for that moment. You see, at that moment, I'm sure when he began to be grabbed, he began to look around. Not only at those who were grabbing him, but what about those who were with him? Have you ever asked someone that question? Hey, are you with me? Are you with me? What about looking out for those who were around you? Like, what just happened here? I, I don't understand. What's happening? What's going on? But then he was denied. He was denied. He says, he was deserted. In verse 50, then all his disciples deserted, deserted him and ran away. You know, there was teaching in the temple. They knew where he was. They, it wasn't like they had to go and search and, and bring out the SWAT team. They knew where he was, but they chose this moment for a setup to get him. And Jesus asked the question, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you get me in the temple? I was there every day. He said, but these things are happening to fulfill the scriptures. See, it's already foretold. It's already happening. It's already out there that it's going to happen. And now it's happening. Just as it was said. But when he was denied after being betrayed, I wonder how much loneliness he felt. And see, if you're betrayed, that's one thing. If you think somebody's got your back and then they don't, that's one thing. If you think somebody's with you and they aren't, that's one thing. You say, okay, well, that was that one. But what if you looked around at all those others closest to you? And by deserting you, they basically denied that they were with you. Betrayed. Denied. And it was only the beginning. If I ask you in your mind to think about those who have your back, those who are going to go the extra mile for you, those people that you could call on at 2 and 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning to have your back if you were in need, no matter the circumstance, no matter the issue, no matter if you were in trouble, no matter what, they could, you could call them and they would be there. Think about those people. Think about those people in your life. Now imagine for a moment, if you call them, and they're, they're with you, and then all of a sudden you were set up and they were gone. Imagine we would feel tremendous emotional stress as well. 
betrayed and denied. So they grabbed him, arrested him, and they took him before the council. In verse 53, before the Sanhedrin, the supreme council of leaders and religious leaders and leaders of the law that would have jurisdiction over religious matters and other matters as well. It says, they took Jesus to the high priest's home where the leading priests, the elders, and teachers of religious law had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance. Went right into the high priest's courtyard. There he sat with the guards, warming himself by the fire. So he cared, but he didn't go in and just jump in and say, hey, I'm here for the rescue. While inside, the leading priest and the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. So they were looking for a way. They were looking for something that they could put on him. They were looking to gather evidence that did not exist from the only perfect man to have ever walked the face of the earth because he was the son of God. And the next sentence says, but they couldn't find any. They couldn't find any. So you see, they begin to have these folks speak up and say, hey, but didn't you see something? Oh, yeah, and I think you saw something, and, and what did you see? Don't you know, don't you have some dirt on him? Don't you have some dirt on him? You see, they're trying to find witnesses to come up with evidence that doesn't exist. How many of you have ever witnessed an accident or a crime? Raise your hand. If you've ever witnessed an accident or a crime, get them up there. Okay, hands down. Of those of you who have, how many knew there were other witnesses as well? You weren't the only witness. There were multiple witnesses. All right, hands down. I almost promise you there were some glitches in the story from one to the other, right? Because you see it happen sometimes. Can you describe the guy? Yeah, he was like 5'6", 140, dark hair, um, blue T-shirt. And they asked somebody else. He's like 6'1", um, blonde-headed, uh, probably 250. I mean, he was a big guy. Like, How, what? How, maybe that was the guy with him. I don't. But we do that. We do that. I was sitting, and this is just a little lesson, too, for those of you who are about to get your license. In two lanes of one-way traffic at a stoplight, and the car to the, in my left lane has stopped in motion for this young boy to turn left the other day. And his super nice, brand-new-looking sports car, about 17 years old, to go ahead and turn into the restaurant. So he makes it through the one lane, and guess what happens in the other lane? Bam! You got it right in front of me. And I was like, ooh, I saw that coming. Saw that coming. Did not end well. But a lot of people saw it. Guess how many stuck around to tell about it? You see, in this particular case, these witnesses had no evidence. They even contradicted each other. But finally, in verse 57, some men stood up and gave this false testimony. They didn't get their story straight, but they thought, this will have some teeth. This will have some bite. This will get the job done. So we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. And the high priest stood up. And then he asked Jesus, well, aren't you going to say anything for yourself? What do you have to say for yourself? What's your, what's your alibi? What do you have to come back to that? What are you going to do about all that's being said about you, all this evidence that 
is being shared against you. But Jesus was silent and made no reply. How many of us ever have anyone or anything said or that comes against us that we are silent? Because if we're silent, what we're really saying is what? We're guilty. Versus just going, you know what? It really doesn't matter what I say anyway because you're going to think what you're going to think anyway, right? But it's hard for us. But what an amazing example. But when he was asked a pointed question, he says, but the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? See, in the middle of all this being framed, see, he was betrayed, denied, and framed. Just trying to come up with evidence, trying to come up with stuff. And he didn't say a word. He just said, you know what? Just keep on sharing. He didn't go, that's a lie. That's not true. That didn't happen. You're making that up. Just let it all finish out. Because his trust was in his father. His trust was in what the scriptures had already foretold. He knew what was going to come. He previously just said in the garden, Father, if you can take this cup from me, please do it. I don't, this suffering, I don't really want to endure, but I don't want that if it's not your will. I want your will. You see, in our lives, sometimes when we are Betrayed, when we're denied, when we are framed, when something's not just so. Maybe that's happening for a greater good. But we maybe need to stick more to God's will for our lives and not our own. Maybe the suffering we're going through is so that we can one day help someone else. Maybe the suffering we're going through is to make us stronger in our faith and in our relationship with Christ. If I said this morning, I want everyone who would love to suffer physically, emotionally, financially all this week, just be in a place of complete misery and suffering, please stand up. I think we'd get the same reaction we got right now. In fact, some of you turned your heads and go, who is it? Who wants that? I don't know. No, I'm not that guy. But maybe it's for a greater good. You see, being betrayed, denied, even framed, Jesus was composed. And that's a hard thing for us to do sometimes is keep our composure even when things are not going well. He didn't say anything until he was asked that pointed question. And then he said, verse 62, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Man, what composure. Spoke the truth when he was asked about the truth. And he shared exactly what he would be doing, where he'd be going. Verse 63, then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, Why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard this blasphemy. What is your verdict? And they all yelled guilty and said he deserves to die. And see, Jesus didn't say right here, hey, but I'm the son of God. I'm the son of man and the son of God. I'm a man on this earth, but I am the Messiah, 
the Savior. Even though you're hating on me, even though you are arresting me, I'm going to die for those sins too. One of the things that just jumped out at me as I was reading this and preparing is in the midst of our tough times, in the midst of those who are around us who wa wouldn't want us to succeed, in the midst of those around us who are saying things that aren't true, in the midst of those who are around us that want bad things for us, do we still have our hope in Christ? Do we still have our composure? Do we still say, hey, you know what? This ride on earth is not going to be easy. It's not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to have trial and trouble because it's a sinful world. We were born into a sinful, broken world. So they all yelled guilty. And then... The Bible says in verse 65, Then some of them began to spit at him, and they blindfolded him and beat him with their fists. Prophesy to us, they jeered. And the guards slapped him as they took him away. So we went from being composed to abused. And I guess the thing for me, one of the things for me is in looking at this passage of Scripture and, and looking at as we go forward into next week and the cross. At any moment in time, he could have stopped it all. At any moment in time, he could have said, that's it. Boom. You're out. You're out, you're out, I'm free. I'm not enduring this any longer. Because he is the Messiah. He is the only way to heaven. Son of the Most High God. But he allowed himself to be blindfolded and beaten, spit upon, Slapped. And even then, he just kept his composure. Said, okay. And that was just the beginning of the abuse that we'll see. And Isaiah 53 Verse 5 through 7 says this, But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all, mine and yours. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep is silent before the shearers. He did not open his mouth. In the midst of all those things, he kept his composure and he didn't speak a word. If I ask you this morning, when's the last time you were in, a, in the midst of a mess and you didn't say anything? When's the last time you were in the middle of all this junk going on and you just said, you know what, I'm, I'm not even getting in it. I'm going to stay out of it because God's going to show up. He's going to do something. Any one of these is enough to break us. Yet he endured it without conflict for you and me. Can you imagine being blindfolded, punched, over and over and over and slapped 
over and over and over with folks jeering at you. Just laughing at you, mocking you, saying, oh yeah, who was that who just punched you in the head? Who just punched you in the face? You should know you're the Son of God, you're the Messiah. Hmm. See, any one of those for us would be enough for us to use those four words that come to mind when we get fired up. I wish you would. I wish you would say that. I wish you would push me. I wish you would. Any one of those, he endured it all for you and for me. I wonder this morning, where are you in your view of what he did for us? Yeah, that's, whew, that's tough. He must have been a tough guy to endure all that. He did it for me, and, and I appreciate it. I really do. Or are you there this morning and you go, I didn't understand the depth of what all happened. If you were witnessing this on the street, you would jump in and you would stop it. You would do something. I would hope that you would. Besides getting out your stinking phone and videoing it. Nothing fires me up more. Sorry, this is on the side. But nothing fires me up more than something horrific is happening to somebody and somebody wants to film it instead of jumping in there and ripping somebody off of somebody saying, hey, we've got to stop this mess. Let's quit being crazy. But if you witness this, and if it were for you and you knew it, would you jump in there and try to do something about it? Would you get him over to the side after it was all over and say, Jesus, thank you. I know what's coming next, but thank you. This was just the start of it. You know, when you have children growing up or when they're small, one of the things that most disrespectful things they learn to do is to spit at somebody. And you say, we don't spit. We don't spit on other people. We don't spit at all. And then you walk down the sidewalk, Dad, and you spit in the grass. And they're like, well, Daddy does it. Yeah. But when they get into a conflict, little ones, they just... <laughs> one of the most disrespectful things you could do. And that's how this began. I'm spitting on you because you are nothing, Jesus. We're going to spit on you. We're going to slap you. We're going to beat you. And we're going to show you that you are not who you say you are. And witnessing all of that, if you were there, would you go to him and tell him, I appreciate that. There's no way I can get to God except through you, Jesus. And I trust you and I thank you. I ask you this morning, if you are not sure where you will spend eternity, either in heaven with God himself, and Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, or in hell for all of eternity. And hell is real, by the way. Understand that. There is a real heaven and a real hell. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So this morning, had you been there, would you go running to him and say, I have accepted you. I believe in you. I know that you died on the cross, that you rose again. I understand that. Thank you for saving me. Or would you be there and you would say, I don't know. I just don't know. Listen, this morning I want to tell you that Jesus died that you might have eternal life and that you might have abundant life here on this earth. But the only way you can get that is to accept His invitation. To accept what He did on the cross. To accept all that He endured and believe it and ask Him to come into your heart and life. 
That's it. That's the only way. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never experienced that. I, I challenge you. I beg you to come and make your way right down here. And I will meet you and I will share Christ with you and how we can do that. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, well, you don't know where I've been, preacher. You don't know what I've got going on. Listen, God doesn't care where you've been. He cares where you're going. It's from this day forward. We can't fix last week. We can't fix two months ago. We can't fix 10 years ago, even 50 years ago. But we can fix right now forward. And maybe in your family this morning, there's something going on. You just need to bring your family down here and just say, you know what, family, I love you. We are going a different direction. We're going to change some things up. And it's going to be different in our house. Maybe you just got some junk going on in your life. You just need to leave laying right down here. I challenge you, just bring it all. Bring it all. Come to the well. That fresh drink of water. That living water that only Christ can offer. Would you pray with me, Father? We thank you so much for this day. God, we thank you for the beautiful sunshine. We thank you for your beautiful son. God, who endured so much, we can't even begin to fathom. But God, because of Jesus, we can have abundant life. We can have eternal life in heaven. Lord, you just move as only you can in this time of imitation. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.